Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Troglies Guitar Show, your daily dose of guitar information. What is this? <laughs> oh boy, this is going to be a long episode because it needs a lot of explaining to really understand what this guitar is. Most people, they're going to look at it and go, hey, that, that's a PRS Custom 22. Gibson, don't you have any original ideas? So, let's talk about it. In the summer of 2017, Gibson announced to their dealers that they were going to do a new modernized double cut shape. It's not going to be like the juniors of the late 50s and 60s. It was going to be something completely new and different with this whole offset horn thing. And this is what they delivered. Kind of a freaky mashup of a bunch of different things. Many people were very quick to judge it as just a PRS knockoff, and yes, they did take some design elements from PRS, but notice a Custom 22 actually has further humbucker spacing. Versus these guys, it's the traditional Gibson DC spacing, because they have 24 frets. Now you might ask, why not compare it to a Custom 24? That'll have the same spacing. Well, it comes down to 24s always having a tremolo unit on it, and the neck profile is completely different from the DC Modern. So that pushes the neck pickup a little bit closer to the bridge, so sonically they'll still be very different. But, I mean, if I'm being honest here, the PRS, it's got a sleeker, curved body to it. I think their offerings just look a little bit better. And to be completely fair, their single cuts are just a complete ripoff of a Les Paul with modernized appointments. So, I mean, can either company really have any beef with each other? No. <laughs> But this one's kind of like part of my whole quest to document all the different double cut models. I don't personally like them as much as their single cut brethren, but they do have some interesting tales behind them. So in 1959, Gibson finally introduces like the double cut junior. It then evolved into the SG and was pretty much retired outside of a few reissues in the 70s. But then other brands such as Hamer came along and repopularized it. Paul Reed Smith's original design stemmed from this. Gibson was feeling the heat. They started to design something new. That was this. This was one of the first prototypes for the double cut Les Paul. Now you can check out this video to learn more about it, but I just wanted to document them side by side, how far we've come from the prototype stages to what they consider the modern double cut. Now from the prototype stages, it took about five years until they got something that they were happy with, and that was called the Custom Shop DC Pro. Side by side, they look like these. Sorry, I don't have one. I have to just mock this up after the fact. During that same year, they introduced the USA Studio versions. Haven't documented one of those. But then in 1998, they introduced the DC Standard. And this was a design that lasted for a good long time. And then they eventually worked into like a traditional Les Paul cutaway that was a double cut. Those things are a little bit weird. But then in the 90s, there was a model that I thought this was going to be just like it. And I absolutely love it. And it's an underrated model that not enough people know about. It's the Gibson M3. Now, out of all the crazy Gibson Super Strats of the mid 80s to the very early 90s, the M3 is the only one that had any amount of success. They actually even reissued these things. But check out this full review and demo to learn more about those, but those things are just amazing to play. And they look very similar to this, don't they? But there's actually one more model that this thing probably took some influence from, and it's one that I don't think a lot of the American viewers will know about. But if you live in Japan, you might know of a guy named Tak Matsumoto. He actually had a signature guitar since the mid 2000s. It looked very similar to this. So technically these things in 2017 were not exactly new. They were just a slightly refined version of that guitar because most Americans didn't really understand who that guy was. Now, side by side here, you can see there's some significant differences in the control layout, such as the toggle switch up here on the top horn, but the shape is very similar. So, so perhaps this was Gibson's way of just seeing, huh, could we market the Tak Matsumoto in a new way and make more money off of it? Now, history's gonna tell the tale, but as of right now, no, people did not like these things that much. And then to complicate things even further, in winter of 2018, they introduced a semi-hollow version of this guitar. They gave them rather girly colors that remind me of the Vixen series, and it just happens to look like a Duesenberg double cat. But it's just kind of an interesting addition to the double cut family within the Gibson brand. 
Now, brand new, these things range from about four to $5,000, depending on what color you wanted, what kind of top you wanted. You can find them in standard configuration. You can find them in custom configuration. There's solid colors, which are cheaper. Then there's also the flame tops. I mean, this is one of the higher end standards called sterling silver. Why they gave it a red back, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of quirky, but I dig it. But now that we kind of understand how we got here and how it's not just necessarily a PRS ripoff, because remember, Gibson did the whole double cut thing first as compared to PRS. But what is it like to actually play this thing? It feels so similar to a Les Paul, it's strange. This top horn doesn't feel like the big offset fender bodies or anything like that. It doesn't quite hug you the same way. So that feels very familiar. The cutaway here feels and looks very familiar. You're gonna notice the different spacing between the humbuckers and the different control layout, but it's very familiar to like a custom shop Les Paul. It's got a really nice, what I would consider a 59 neck profile to it. It's like not overly thick, but it's not underly thick either. It's what I would consider almost a perfect neck profile. But it suffers the same fate of all the other double cuts, in my opinion. They've got the 24 frets, right? So it moves the neck pickup down. But the extra two frets are pretty much worthless on these guitars. They're not super comfortable to get to. Now, unlike some of the other double cuts, I can easily get to all 22 and just stretch to get that 23rd. But, but the 24th is still uncomfortable. You got to reach for it because you start hitting all this stuff. I really wish this would have had a sculpted neck joint because that's just what a modern guitar should have. Another thing I think a modern guitar should have is locking tuners stock. But for whatever reason, they just went for Grover tuners. But besides that, just how modern is this guitar spec-wise? Let's go ahead, throw it on the workbench and discuss that further. Pickup-wise, these are stock with a 57 Classic in the neck and a 57 Plus in the bridge. What that means for you is the bridge is going to be a little bit hotter, which is what most people want anyways. So the neck is around 7.7. Then your bridge is surprisingly less hot than the neck. That must be like an overwound 57 or something. Okay, middle position 3.85. That, that is baffling to me. But something else you're gonna notice here is this pickup is all the way from 2015, whereas the bridge one is from 2017. Someone had different pickups in here at one point in time, so it's very possible that's replaced or just old stock. Looking into the neck pickup cavity though, you can see you've got a nice long neck tenon and you can see through to the mahogany body. There you can see it's a full maple top, just like a regular Les Paul. But here's something that's a little bit cool within the bridge pickup cavity. It's not actually routed all the way through the maple top. So you still have some maple left within the pickup cavity. I don't think I've ever seen that on a Les Paul. But there you can see they routed down to the mahogany for the legs of the pickup. So that's just kind of a, a quirky little feature. But control wise, you just have a master volume right here close to the bridge pickup and a master tone. And your three-way toggle switch is right in between them. A classic layout for Gibson and a bunch of other manufacturers. But being a modern guitar, wouldn't you think this would have coil splitting? It doesn't. It doesn't have any type of fancy electronics going on, which is kind of the opposite of what modern means to me when it comes to the Gibson lineup. Now, keep in mind, these came out before the whole Les Paul Modern, SG Modern came out. So for somebody who's new to Gibson that just thinks modern means all these modern amenities from the 2019 lineup, they're going to be really confused if they see one of these at a shop. And get this, an ABR1 bridge. I mean, normally I'm all for an ABR1, but it doesn't make sense to put this on a brand new model that's supposed to be modern. I feel like this is where a Nashville style bridge should go because being a brand new guitar, they can design it any way they want. You won't have people saying, oh, it wasn't that way in the 50s. So that was kind of a feature that surprised me. And you also have a lightweight aluminum tailpiece on these guys. So it's got some slightly quirky specs that I wasn't necessarily expecting, but you still have a two-piece maple top. It sits right on top of a mahogany body. I'm not quite sure what the weight relief structure will be for this, if it has any at all. I'll have to look that up on the website here and put it on the screen. But it's an average maple top. I wouldn't call this spectacular, but moving on here, we have a rosewood fretboard on top of a traditional mahogany neck. So everything's pretty much the same right here. You've got your acrylic looking inlays. 
And the frets, they're not huge, they're not tiny, they're just what I would expect the frets to be. But I really do like the rosewood on this one, it's nice and streaky. But you can see there are a few light gouging marks in the fretboard from the fret work, or who knows, maybe it happened after the custom shop had it, but I definitely want to make sure you guys know they're there. But the headstock, once you take the truss rod cover off, it's just like a regular Les Paul here. We've got a few scratches and stuff from string changes and polishing this guy up. But I think this headstock just looks a little bit plain, if we're being honest here. It needs some sort of silk screen. I would like to see like DC Modern on it in the Les Paul script. Or maybe just have something on the truss rod cover. We have a nut width of 1.67 inches. And that increases to 2.05 at the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.86. By the 12th, we're at 0.96. I mean, it's a really nice chunky 59 neck. Not overly fat, but not skinny by any means. Now this is supposed to be a 24 and 3 quarters inch scale, but you can see it's not quite that. If you take a look at the 12th fret, it looks like it's about 12 and like 4 and a half sixteenths. You get 24 and 9 sixteenth inches as your scale length, so, huh. A little bit funky right there, I would say. Surprise, the back is red. So the top is called Sterling Silver, not Cobra Burst. Very similar, but then you get to the back here. It's quite a chunky guitar. I figured they would have streamlined this one similar to the M3 model and gave it a skinnier body, but no, it feels very much like a Les Paul in its thickness. And it is solid body and construction. I do not believe there's any type of weight relief. This one's had different pickups in it. And you can see when they reinstalled it that they burnt the finish a little bit with their soldering iron, but not a huge deal. But as far as a modern amenity, there's no binding on the back, but it wouldn't because it's a standard format anyways. I don't believe the custom version of this has that either. But you've got a comfort carve right here, a belly cut. But I think they failed right here. This is what the M3 has over this design because it's just like a regular style Les Paul heel. As we were talking about earlier, you don't necessarily get any higher up on the neck. It's got the same double cut curse. They've got 24 frets and the smushed together humbuckers, but they don't have full access. Not in my opinion anyways. But up here is something that I deeply appreciate. The Gibson Apex head carve. Rest in peace, my friend the rhino horn essentially so this was introduced somewhere around 2017 and they discontinued it very early 2019 so you can bet your butt in 25 30 years if you have a 2017 to 2019 model with this goofy thing on it they're gonna be like oh yeah you've got the rhino horn it's essentially a modern day volute that didn't even get enough of a chance to be accepted into the market. They pretty much borrowed this from Martin, but it's essentially just a beefier area where the headstock is weakest, and then it just kind of continues up here. Now, if you want Schaller tuners on here, good luck, because you're not going to be able to. <laughs> the wood slopes up. But stock, these originally came with Grovers, which are back on here. Somebody had put a different type of tuner on here. So if you look really closely, like around here, you can just see a slightly larger imprint. So here you can see the serial number. That dates it to 2017 and 290th in production. And this particular example weighs 8 pounds, 5.3 ounces. So let's go ahead and hear how it sounds. <laughs>
Final thoughts on the DC Modern. This thing is quirky, but I like it. I think at their original sales price of $4,000 plus, no. <laughs> there's a reason why there's a million of these still out there and prices are starting to come down. But now that they're kind of in like that mid $2,000 to almost $3,000 range, I think that's when people are going to start picking these up and going, huh, maybe there is something nice about this. I mean, it doesn't have modern features despite being called a modern. We went over that on the workbench. I think there's definitely some sleek refinements that they could have done, such as a sculpted heel joint, gave it locking Grover tuners. You know, throw the coil splitting on there for good measure. But I think they could have even additionally contoured the front, made the body a little bit thinner, kind of like a uh, Les Paul custom light or an access, something like that, just to get it, you know, a little bit more sleek and refined. I'm pretty sure Gibson has pretty much given up on this design, but I think with a few more refinements, you know, maybe they could do another limited release of this run once all the old stock is gone. So that's how I feel about this. Would I buy another one? Definitely. I would be interested in documenting the custom version, even though pretty much the only difference will be the type of binding they use. You get a different frat board and you get a fancier looking headstock. But as a Les Paul guy, I know a Les Paul standard just for whatever reason, it feels and plays differently and sounds different from a custom. So that must be the case in this one, too. And I'd love to try out one of the uh, semi hollow versions. That would just be freaky. So if you can get a good enough of a price on one of these, I think they're worth it. And if you're interested in owning this one, because most of the cheap leftover stock models are just solid color finishes. They don't have the nice flame tops and things like that. So if you're interested in this one, you can check out that link in the description. But let's go ahead and review the condition of this. So the face of the headstock, again, it had different tuners on it at one point in time. I just restored it back to original. That way people weren't confused as to what originally came on these in the future. But you've got some scratches on the face of the headstock here. Truss rod cover, it's what you normally expect on a Gibson. The frets on this one show very minimal wear, hardly any at all. I just cleaned up those frets. We oiled the fretboard, so you're definitely good to go there. And the body, it just has some light picking scratches. I would say the most wear on this guitar is mainly concentrated on the back. But the front, I mean, it looks really clean, right? As the light's running over it, but you can see a few minor impressions and scratches here and there but everything is functioning the way it should. Moving on to the back, you can see your serial number and the apex head carve one more time here. Beautiful neck. I did not notice any gouges or anything off of it, but you can see if we get it in the light just right, there are a few minor impressions on the back and some scratches. So it's not mint condition. It's pretty much what a floor model version of this guitar would look like. But here's something interesting that I really didn't cover the rest of this review that I probably should have. They still have that exposed maple top. They did the thin binding in the cutaway. It's just strange how this was marketed as a modern guitar, but yet they did so many vintage spec things to it. I think that's why I like it. It's just so quirky. It's not what I would have expected a modern guitar to be specced at, but it's so quirky. Vintage in some modernness, it for some reason it works for me. And when they installed this larger strap button on the bottom, they kind of chipped the finish right there. So that will continue to chip. Just don't pick at it. You should be okay. Maybe even get a luthier to like uh, clear coat that over or something if you're worried about it. But it's at the bottom. You don't see it anyways. Man, this thing, it's quirky. Let's go check it out under blacklight. Being a fairly modern guitar, yeah, it doesn't glow too much, but you can see a little bit. We'd be able to see if there was a touch-up of any kind. Inlays glow because they're acrylic. Face of the headstock, looking good. Back of the headstock, also looking pretty good here. Back of the neck, you don't have the finish worn off yet, but hey, 
if this gets in a player's hand, maybe one day. So back of the guitar, also looking good. Running around the sides. I'm not seeing any stand rash or anything either. So I would say this passes the black light test with flying colors, but ooh, there you go. So somebody played this a little bit. You've got some sweat absorption right there. It's not brand new. The original case for these guys are the Gibson Custom small rectangular cases. I know it looks like an Explorer case, but it's not an Explorer case. It's much smaller. So you've got one on the outside, another latch on the other side, a locking combo lock. I'm surprised they still even use those things. They don't do it on the modern day USAs anymore, but for whatever reason, they do it on the custom shop. Keeping the innocent innocent, as they say. So it's molded for a double cut inside here. We've got the pre-pack checklist, it says modern DC, and you got some of the original uh, Chicago Music Exchange stuff in here, but here's your COA that you want to see, the modern DC. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Gibson modern double cut in sterling silver, you can check out that link in the description that will take you to the reverb for sale page. Thank you troglodytes for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this one, I did, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.